Hi everyone. Good evening once again. Uh, my name is Shuchi. I'm one of the co-founders of the Chennai Photo Biennale. Thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, from wherever you are. And I know we have some members over here with us uh, at the Goethe Institute. Uh, hi, Parvati, Nayantara, and Bhuma. Uh, it's great that we are all able to do this uh, after a very, very long time where all of us have finally come together. Uh, even if it's a few of us over here in person, but uh, we all welcome you to the third edition of the Chennai Photo Biennale titled Maps of Disquiet. Uh, it has really taken us a very long time and, uh, and hard times. I, I know it's been hard for very many people. Um, and here we are today after a long gap where we had to postpone uh, this edition from last year to this year. Uh, which is now happening in hybrid formats. As you can see, this is one of our hybrid formats of uh, a conversation between our artists and our curators. Uh, the uh, third edition is happening in physical forms in Chennai across the Roja Muthaya Library, the Goethe Institute here where we are all sitting right now, uh, the Forum Art Gallery, the Ashwatthas Gallery, uh, and the Madras Literary Society. So we are very, very happy that we were able to finally show some work in the physical forms at these venues. And a lot of our programming will be uh, in the hybrid forms uh, and also uh, happening digitally. Our artist projects and showcases will be going live very soon and we will keep you all posted. Um, and I now welcome, uh, without taking too much time, I now welcome our uh, co-curator, Bhuma Padmanabhan. Uh, Bhuma is a curator uh, who was earlier in Delhi and uh, we had the good fortune to have her back in Chennai and we pulled her into the Biennale and here we are. Uh, with a four-member curatorial team, two of them who are in Germany, uh, Orko Datta, who's in uh, Calcutta, and uh, Bhuma is here with us in Chennai. Uh, Bhuma, ha I hand over to you to take this evening forward and the conversation forward. Thank you so much, Shuji. Um, it's wonderful to have you here with us. As Arvind said, we have the experience of speaking all the ways Um, I'm going to take, jump into the performance and introduce um, our two wonderful artists who are here. Um, Parvati is with me right here on the internet, and Nayaka joined us on Zoom. So, um, I'm going to be presenting the project, uh, the project that generated for the um, The project that is on the Hi, sorry, Buma. Um, I think that the your audio is not very um, audible. It's not just me. I think some of the other panelists of other people here as well. It's uh, echoing. Is this better? Um, yeah, just just a little bit, but it's it's not very clear. I think it might be the mic that needs to be. I mean, this okay. laptop that's next to you. Uh, is this better now? Or is there an echo still? No, that's much better, yeah. Yeah, much better? Okay, I think we yeah. had two microphones on. Apologize. Mm. So let's use this one until we get to the Q&A. Yeah, okay. So uh, again, welcome everybody. We're going to have pa Parvati is with us here and Nayantra is, gonna, is joining us from Zoom. Many of you have already seen her on your screen. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, the special sort of project that Parvati and Nayantra have developed for Chennai Photo Benali. It's an extension of their ongoing research. But the project at Chennai um, at CPV3 is called Chicken Run. And uh, it is it brings together archival imagery, fresh imagery, performance, storytelling in, in, in a very new ways to actually relook at historical sort of junctures uh, where and, uh, historical junctures where uh, the relationship between India and Korea sort of transformed. Um, and I think Parvati would sort of lead us through the project. Um, the project is being presented in a hybrid, hybrid format. So we have uh, their presentation is a fantastic sort of web page that's coming up. Uh, the project will go live uh, on Monday. And um, 
It includes uh, not only archival images, but also video footage, which uh, we should be sharing with us today as well. So in a, in, a, in a sense, this is sort of like a special preview to what you're gonna be seeing online on Monday. Um, her, her films are also part of the screening room at Goethe Institute. So anybody who wants to come Wednesdays and Saturdays, you can come and catch the films alone as a part of the screening room uh, schedule. Um, to introduce Parvati, uh, she's, our own Chennai-based artist, contemporary artist, a poet, and a writer. And her work is multidisciplinary uh, with sort of where it centered on complex intersections of photography, video, drawing, installation, and text. Um, <clears throat> Parvati's art talks about different engagements with our environment and the philosophies of inhabiting them. Uh, one of the constant themes uh, is that of sustainability and also of, of water. Uh, Parvati is shown at numerous sort of uh, very important sort of platforms. Um, and she is one of the founder members of uh, the Hashtag Collective. Um, she, Parvati has a MA in Fine Arts from Central St. Martin's uh, College of Art and Design and on a Chevening Scholarship. Um, and Welcome Parvati to the evening's talk. Nayantra, who's online. Um, Nayantra Nair is a playwright, researcher, and storyteller from Chennai. She's currently doing her sort of, uh, she's gone on to do her research in the UK. So that's why she's sort of online with us. So it's wonderful. Her research interests include urban spaces, memories, <clears throat> and ecological crisis. Um, her play, The Lottery, was shortlisted for the Hindu Playwright Award. Um, and was also, also read and workshopped at the Fringe Edinburgh. Um, <clears throat> um, Nayantra is a Shevning scholar and a Chase funded scholar as well, currently completing her PhD in creative writing at the University of e East Anglia, Norwich, where she studies water crises through theatrical texts and performance. Welcome Nayantra. Um, can I call upon Parvati to start the presentation? Thank you. Thank you. We would like to thank the whole Chennai Photo Biennale team for organizing this talk and for having us here today. Hi, I'm Parvati. And I'm Nainthara, and we're so glad to be able to talk to you today in this strange format. <laughs> so we're going to start with a picture of my father and we will tell you a bit later why. So when I was very little, my father would tell me stories about the daring do adventures of a certain Miss P, who would help good people flee to safe lands and save princesses from pirates. Miss P did this with the help of her friends, who included a strange shape-shifting individual called Takaragundan Helicopter. I was desperate to know who Miss P was. Could it be me? But my father would only twinkle at me mysteriously and refuse to answer. Fast forward to about two years ago. Could we have a change of slide? That's my father. Fast forward to about two years ago when Nainthar and I were doing our research on the Korean War. And we learned how the Indian soldiers in Korea were totally fascinated by something that they were seeing there for the very first time. Helicopters. Were these magnificent whirly birds the source of my Takaragundan helicopter as a child? Fast forward even further to last year when we had begun the process of creating the archival mate you know, material of our protagonist in Chicken Run, a certain elusive Korean prisoner of war called Mr. H. And suddenly it began to feel that all these stories were interconnected. So the origins of Mr. H is referenced in the first video that we're going to show you. And it is also one of the first works on display at our fictive photo narrative, Chicken Run, when it will be up very soon. So could we have this, the video, A Story of War?
Mr. H would never forget the war. His memories were too painfully clear. But he also tried to remember, in just as much detail, his life before the war. Family, his village, the bird song. Mr. H's village was just north of the 38th parallel, though of course back then, the 38th parallel meant nothing to him. For many Koreans, the 38th parallel didn't exist until 1945, when the Americans and the Russians decided it was the exact latitude along which Korea would be divided. 1945 was also the year that Mr. H's father put him in charge of the whole harvest. He was 16. At the end of the harvest season, men from the Communist Party visited their village looking for new recruits. They promised decent salaries and a bright future. Some men from neighbouring villages joined up, but none from Mr. H's. Their futures were as bright as they needed them to be. Later, the same men returned, but this time they made no promises. Every man over 16 and under 50 was conscripted. That was in 1950, the year North and South Korea went to war. Mr. H found the war both terrifying and bewildering. His days were filled with the sounds of gunfire, bombs and the gasps of dying men. Inexplicably, he also heard the roar of Russian planes, the precise stomping of Chinese soldiers who marched alongside him, the babble of languages from enemy camps, English, French, Greek, Spanish, Thai. Why were all these people in Korea? What were they fighting for? Years later, in Madras, Mr. H met a weary war photographer who said that the Korean War was just another instance of the world's superpowers battling for victory in lands far away from their own. Mr. H remembered bombed out cities and endless lines of people with their possessions tied to their backs as they fled. And he wondered, just who had won? So um, that's you know one of the first videos, as Parvati said. And I guess the question is really, who is Mr. H? You know, why are his experiences of war relevant to us here today? What, in fact, does the Korean War have to do with us sitting here? You know, in in the UK, in Chennai, and to understand that, we need to do we need to share this little known fact of Indian history itself, right? And I'm going to let Parvati lead us on that. So, I mean, you know, when we were in school, when we heard history, we'd go, oh, no, dates. But there's a lot more to history than that, because history is, after all, the stories of our human journey. So here's the historical background on Chicken Run. In 1953, when the armistice was signed in Korea between the North and the South, there remained one huge sticking point. The prisoners of war on both sides who did not want to be repatriated to their home countries. This threatened to unravel the peace because it was a point of pride to the home countries that their soldiers, well, went back home. But, you know, the Korean War was part of the Cold War, communism versus capitalism, and soldiers not wanting to go back to their country, it was seen as a failure of that country's ideology. And while all of this was happening, you know, leaders of countries that were not involved, like Pandit Nehru, they feared that if the peace was broken, the peace that had been, you know, arrived with, at a great deal of difficulty, then the resulting battles could escalate into even World War Three, and all of the powers involved, you know, all the major powers of that time had a presence in the Korean War. So it was at this time that. India suggested at the UN through Ambassador V.K. Krishnamen in a very colorful character and India's representative to the UN at that time, that this prisoner of war problem in quotation marks could be handled by neutral nations. This proposal was accepted. So India's very decorated General Timaya was made the chairman of the Neutral Nations Repatriation Committee that was created to oversee the fate of the prisoners of war And over and above that, some 6,000 Indian troops were offered as peacekeepers, constituting the custodian force of India. And this was headed by General Thorat. So all these people from India were not going to fight any battles. They were going there to look after the prisoners of war. 
and the prisoners of war who had declined to go home, they were going to be taken to the DMZ, to the demilitarized zone, which is still such a contentious space in Korea. And they were going to be looked after by the CFI, the custodian force of India. And it was from Madras, the city that we're all in here today, that the ships sailed towards Korea in 1953. And you know they, they got there, they did their jobs, and after several months of you know, exemplary service, um, the custodian force of India, they returned to Madras. You know. But along with them traveled some 80 odd prisoners of war who had not wanted to go back to their home countries, but they had also not wanted to stay in the country of their captors, right? They wanted to go to a neutral nation, but only India was willing to take them at that point. So here they came. From here, some of them managed to go off towards South America, not long after arriving here. Some returned eventually to Korea itself, and then some stayed on in India. Um, and those who stayed on in India, they took up jobs, um, they trained in photography, uh, they learned, you know, they picked up small businesses, and even took on chicken farming. And it was while reading all of this, there was really scant information available about these prisoners of war who chose to stay in India, that we encountered something really exciting. There was a brief mention, it was maybe one line, you know, about a prisoner of war who wound up in Chennai. And this is the lead that we began to chase. Was he still in Chennai, we wondered? Maybe some of his descendants were here. So if we could just yeah, get the website up. You know, so, yeah. so this is what the website, when it is up, will look like. And we promise you it's going to be magnificent. And this is the landing page of the website where you see images of the mysterious Mr. H at three different stages of his life as a prisoner of war, as a soldier, and as a chicken farmer in Chennai. And it was such questions, you know, that, uh, as Nainthara said, that led to the creation of this photo fictive artwork called Chicken Run, where we follow the life of Mr. H from his childhood in rural Korea to his time as a chicken farmer in Chennai. The exhibition mixes archival photography and new images, we hope fairly seamlessly to tell the story. So the form it takes is that of a research blog belonging to another slightly mysterious character called Curator P. And she's from the People's History Museum of Chennai. So she's planning this exhibition about the Korean involvement, about the Indian involvement in Korea and then she gets fascinated by the story of Mr. H. Her blog is filled with the photographs and videos and texts about Mr. H. She starts with it fairly chronologically and then towards the later chapters of Chicken Run, things get mixed up a little bit. There are things that she can't know. Obviously there are things she won't know, can never know. And these are things that she fills with her active imaginings about Mr. H's life but based on historical research. So let's take you through the opening chapter of Curator P's blog, which is in Chicken Run, which is called Encounters, First Encounters with Barbed Wire. So this is sort of what it looks like when you will navigate it for yourself. The video we just saw, there is an index so you can jump back and forth. And this is the first chapter where you can just, you know, just scroll through it. We'll just sort of take you through it so that you can have a sense of how, you know, he was, um, we, we were trying to think through Curator P what Mr. H's life could have been like when he was trying to live and to fight in war-torn Korea. How was he taken prisoner? And, you know, when the website is done, we've got images of the different ways people were captured by the forces on land, in a boat, in a paddy field. We then sort of, you know, follow this road, you can carry on, to, um, you know, we sort of positioned him, you know, under a tree wondering, you know, did he have a love life? Did he have a lover? Did he fall in love? What happened to this woman, you know, did she survive? We don't know the answers and probably neither did he, as he tried to endure the war through all the uncertainties and cruelties. I would just like to sort of make a small note of the fact of the barbed wire through which, you know, we see Mr. H and through which the images flow. 
because barbed wire for us true chicken run was always both a literal and a metaphorical element. When, you know, it's what the author um, Alan Krell calls the devil's rope. And it was a very effective tool of control in the war because it was so deadly dangerous. But at the same time, it was also something that could if you were doing farming, keep the livestock in safely, keep the chickens in and the wolves out. So, you know, just uh, go through it and uh, Nainpara will take over from here for it. Yeah. So um, in, in that sense, you know, the exhibition, um, it's informed by several different kinds of materiality. Um, you know, writer and philosopher Karen Barad, she says that matter itself is something that it feels, it converses, it suffers, um, it desires, it yearns, you know, and, and we really did try to work with that philosophy somewhere. Um, you know, we work with the material of barbed wire, which you can see in the photographs, with, of, with constructed landscapes, with birds, and of course, with photographs and videos themselves, you know, and, and we played with materiality, with the materiality of the photos in several different ways. And the most obvious is when you were looking at the website there, you might have seen that there were all of these notes and annotations by curator people. That, the, the, the decision to add in these annotations, um, it was something that we, we, a decision we took, a creative decision we took for several reasons. Um, you know, by sort of the midpoint of our research, we were really deeply invested in the geopolitics at play during this time, during Mr. H's early life. And this is what most books and research papers, academic papers uh, discuss. But we were also very interested in how um, an individual, how does a person navigate the geopolitics of a civil war that's also happening within the larger, you know, sort of um, the, the, the auspice, well, sort of the aura of the Cold War. So, you know, annotations, captions, notes, they allowed us to suggest this possible biography of Mr. H. But the biography is not fixed. Um, it isn't a definite biography. Instead, the text also invites viewers into the game of imagining. And that's really at the core of our practice in creating this artwork. So in other words, Curator P's obsessive search and imaginings for Mr. H mirror our own. You know, I can't tell you the amount of research we did with photographs and books and newspaper articles, interviews, videos we'd gathered. And we tried to, you know, play a little creative historical game of fill in the blanks. So when we read a story, we would think, which of these stories could have been that of Mr. H? Could we place him in some of the archival photographs from Korea, the child with the dog, or that POW who sort of half turned towards us, that blurry face in the crowd? Then when we were in the pandemic locked in, we explored what Mr. H might have felt being locked away in prisons. And then as the city opened up again after the worst of the pandemic early this year, we imagine Mr. H being here in the 1950s, trying to rebuild his life as a lone immigrant in a strange land after a brutal war. And, and the thing to sort of understand is that there are really, you know, thousands of photographs from the Korean War um, spread out across dozens of archives, apart from our own collection. And each of these photographs could tell hundreds of stories. You could sort of flip through them, you know, seeing one and then the other and then the other. But, you know, simply sort of looking at these images, it's not quite the same as seeing them. And that's really what we've tried to do. I think seeing implies kind of a sustained engagement, you know, attention to details or building a layered understanding of the photograph itself. So playing with the images, creating possible narratives became one tool in which to turn looking into seeing. And the suppositional quality of the narrative, right, the fact that it's not certain and it's not fixed, it really leaves the image itself open. And in that way, we want people to go and look at look at the uh, eventual exhibition, and I hope all of you will, to linger on the images, to consider the words, to think about what might have come before or after the image. And is there possibly a story that we ourselves have not seen within what you're looking at? You know, it's really a kind of creative play. And I, you know, I have to sort of go back to my kind of college days and sort of say there was a certain deconstructive process at the center of it. And when you do that, it allows you to find certain resonances and certain patterns, as in the video that we're going to show. 
So we were able to kind of mirror the construction of the POW camps, and these are genuine archival videos that were made to enclose the prisoners of war with a farm that Mr. H might have built later to keep his chickens safe. Can we play that video for them? It's called Building Enclosures. In Chennai, Mr. H's chicken farm was on a not too large piece of land, right off the dirt road that led to the highway. All around his land were paddy fields for as far as the eye could see. The land itself was perfect, but pipes had to be installed, coops had to be built, and fences put up. Even after all that, Mr. H sometimes felt that his chicken farm would never truly be finished. There was always something that needed to be put up or fixed or added. But he was proud of his little farm. He'd built the chicken coops along modern lines and they could house up to 50 chickens. Mr. H had taken particular care with his fencing. He had to keep the chickens in and the wild dogs and thieves out. As he was building it, he had experienced vivid flashbacks from his time in Joje and the DMZ. When this happened, Mr. H reminded himself that these fences weren't for him. He'd climbed taller and more cruel fences, and now, he was free. So Hind Nagar was the name of the Indian settlement in the DMZ that was built specially for them. So as Nainthara mentioned, when we dug up these accounts of the prisoners of war, um, chicken farming, which seems like such a strange uh, you know, juxtaposition with war, did turn up as an actual thing that many of the prisoners of war who came to India engaged in. But to kind of tell you how, you know, to sort of demystify the process a bit for you, we then read up a little bit about chicken farming. And we found that between 51 and 57, India made a strong push towards modernizing the poultry industry here. So that got us thinking, is that why, you know, the prisoners of war were taught chicken farming? And then we wondered, did Mr. H take to chicken farming because of his roots in rural Korea, you know, growing up in a farm amidst abundant harvests and livestock. So, you know, these are some of the images that sort of uh, will take up a later section of the story that Curator P is putting together. It is called Seeking Bolt Hole, Parents Required. So Nantara, mm -hmm. you can take it away while she sort yeah. of... So, you know, there are several points of intersection between Mr. H's life and poultry farming. Um, similarities between the life of a prisoner of war and a broiler chicken you know, aside, um, there were themes of the environment that we really couldn't ignore. So until the 1950s, poultry farming in India has was this backyard activity. It served a limited population, but with subsequent modernization, there were undoubtedly benefits, but there were also many unforeseen consequences with regard to you know, local ecology and landscapes and sustainability. And, and the parallels between this kind of destruction that large scale industries that were unchecked you know, could cause and the destruction of, of nature through war itself, the, the very destructive nature of war rather, it was very apparent to us. So again, we were sort of thinking, what does peace mean to someone who's lived through that? Um, so it must mean some freedom, some maybe self-reliance, a sense of safety, but also surely it would mean, you know, access to clean air and water and food, a land that is safe to walk on. And that's very much what activists and scientists are talking about when they're talking about, you know, the very concept of sustainability. 
Yeah, I mean, today's sustainability refers to a way for the human civilization to coexist with the Earth's biosphere. It means that we meet our own needs, but without compromising the needs of a future generation to meet their needs. So in such a view, I would say war is one of the least sustainable of human activities. Consider that the DMZ is even now home to hundreds of thousands of landmines that were placed there. But, you know, given that sustainability also looks to protect our natural environment, human and ecological health, I would say that pollution, reclaiming very precious wetlands to build urban buildings are pretty high up there on the non-sustainable list too. And, you know, as we sort of, as we read through this more and, and we looked more into it, we also encountered um, this little fact about the demilitarized zone in Korea today, which is that it's, it's a huge nature reserve. It's home to species of animals and birds that, are, that aren't found elsewhere in Korea. And this is because, you know, of the fact that it has been left untouched by humans for at least the last 70 odd years. And we began to wonder whether even during the worst of the war, would Mr. H have encountered some sort of, you know, ecological sort of buoyancy, nature of some kind in this very stark landscape of the demilitarized zone? Or maybe not. But there is a picture we have which shows a set of birds perched on a wire in the DMZ. It's a very, it's not an unusual photograph, but when you think of the DMZ and the barbed wire and these people, you know, the Indians who'd gone to this cold place and were trying to make sense of what they were doing, the prisoners of war behind barbed wire. And you see this picture of this little wire and these birds sitting on it. It's somehow very moving. So that picture of the bird led us to the idea that the time period in which Mr. H would have been in Chennai, which is the 1950s and the 1960s, presented us with a chance to go back in time to Chennai's wetlands and see what, you know, what it was like then. And then we decided that if we telescoped time, interesting patterns appear in a person's life. So when you think of Mr. H, he must have been a very lonely prisoner of war, terrified that his North Indian, North Korean roots made him suspect in South Korean eyes, but the fact that he had no home to return to in North Korea and therefore he didn't want to go back to North Korea made him a traitor in North Korean eyes. So we speculated to, through curator P, did he secretly come to see the custodian force of India guards as friends, people that he could trust because of their neutrality and to whom in the end he did actually eventually surrender and asked to be taken to a neutral country. And then we telescoped time to years later when he was in Chennai and he became a bird watcher. And this rather lonely immigrant in Chennai went to Palikarne and found these birds. And in them, he found another set of strange friends. Um, yeah, I should just say the images that we, that we showed you in the previous section where you saw the soldiers and the birds, uh, the birds were taken from Birdo Rajiv Kalmari's fantastic collection. He very kindly gave us time and the photos, but he also gave us you know, insight into the world of bird watching. And in fact, we learned from him that Palikarnet, though not pristine, is still home to so many bird species. And this again suggested to us that buoyancy, you know, urban expansion has, has damaged so much of the marsh, it suggests that there is a chance that, you know, however small the chance is, that it could still be returned to some sort of version of its former state. It's just, it requires action on our part, you know? Um, so just to sort of move on, um, we should say the Chicken Run is part of a, a larger project. And it's, it, the larger project we're working with the INCO Center, and it's called Limits of Change. Uh, we started this project early in, I think, 2018. And the project is more about the custodian force of India and their role in the Korean War. Um, and actually, the last video we have that's a part of Chicken Run um, was really, is really the starting point of this larger project, in a sense. And it, it begins from the knowledge that the first major international mission that the newly created Indian Army is sent off on is not one of war, but of peace. So if we could just play that video as well. This one is called Returning to India. Recrossing Waters is the actual title 
of the work and it's, Sorry. it sort of details how the, the I can only guess what Mr. H felt about leaving the place he had lived in all his life. Anxiety? Fear? Hope? Were some of his fears allayed seeing the warm welcome given to the returning custodian forces of India when their ships docked at Madras? Let me read you a small article I found welcoming the CFI back to India. After nearly six months of exemplary service, the custodian forces of India have finally returned home from Korea. Stationed within the dangerous demilitarized zone of the 38th parallel, the CFI were protectors and guards to Korean prisoners of war who did not want to return to their home countries. The CFI faced many challenges, including the icy Korean winter and difficult prisoners. Their hard work and dedication have won them international acclaim. After a long journey, which included a train ride from the demilitarized zone to the port city of Incheon, and then several weeks spent aboard ships, the CFI reached Madras yesterday. Mr. Rajagopalachari, Chief Minister of Madras, and his entire cabinet received them with much celebration. Mr. Rajagopalachari remarked in his speech, These are soldiers of a great peace emissary who by their work and behaviour have brought great credit to the motherland. General Thorat, leader of the CFI, said that their return to India was truly overwhelming. Along with the CFI was a small group of Chinese and Korean prisoners of war. These men, having decided not to return to their home countries, nor to the other side, chose to come to India. Several have expressed an interest in immigrating to the American continents. We welcome them to India and wish them the very best. So now what is so very special for us to, in the process of creating limits of change and from there the Chennai Photo Biennale's work, Chicken Run, was that the origins of it was from an autobiographical space. It started with my father, the late General TNR Naya, who is the, the middle person in the second row of pictures. And that is actually a picture of the people who went with General Thorat on a first recce mission to Korea. So my father had left his papers to me specifically. And when Nainthara finished you know, her MA and came back, I suggested to her that we do a project of art and storytelling based on something from my father's personal archive. And so we went through the papers and one of the biggest surprises to us was that my father had spent roughly a year in Korea with the CFI because he had gone earlier with, you know, on a recce with General Thorat and then stayed on till the end of the CFI's time in Korea. So the video material that we showed you actually, you know, that's him at, you know, uh, in sort of this, in the D DMZ zone. And the video material that we showed you from building enclosures and recrossing waters were all taken by my father. All this archival material came from him because he loved photos and films and art and poetry and stories. And again, it was very obvious that some of this material was filmed by him from a helicopter, you know, that machine again, and then about ships and then to the port of Chennai. So there was that, and then the knowledge that the CFI story about which we at that time knew nothing, but the fact that it seemed to start and begin in Chennai, that there is such a large, contingent of Koreans who live here today, all of this made it, you know, a, a story that we wanted to pursue. And we really do have to thank Rati Jafar, who's 
in the audience today for encouraging and supporting us through this project. Though I must say that, you know, the autobiographical center of the work carried a huge, powerful charge. And I think, I hope that some of that charge is seen and present in the, you know, that oft used word and the passion with which we craft the work. But we were also very certain that this was not going to be some hagiographical portrait. We were going to use the facts to create something fictional and with Chicken Run, something that hopefully blurs sort of history and story, fact and fiction, just a little bit. Yeah, and um, I mean, we should, we, we've talked a lot about the blurring of those lines, but I should say, you know, there is really solid research um, behind all of this blurring. And um, Mr. H's life, while, while certainly fictionalized, is based upon, you know, um, real research. And I mean, we, once we'd identified the historical events and within, you know, the personal papers of my grandfather, we then had to look at recorded history, right? And while the Korean War was very well documented in the West, um, any material from the Indian perspective, it's quite hard to access. Um, I remember that our first leads, you know, early on, I think in, in, in 2018, um, were from a General Ayan Cardoza, who managed to get us access into the United Services Institute Library, where I went there and I sat and I looked through a whole bunch of different kinds of uh, texts and documents. Um, and then, you know, we managed to find one soldier who had been in Korea as a part of the um, custodian forces, a General Matthew Thomas. Uh, then later on, we somehow managed to meet Jeram Ramesh, who led us to the Nehru Library in Delhi, where we found a couple of things. And, you know, that's kind of how it kind of collected like that over time. And then finally, our, our biggest source was that we had to track down this book um, called Experiments in Neutrality by General Timaya, who was the chairman of the Neutral Nations Repatriation Committee. And um, he'd written this book and it was this wonderful you know, font of information, but we didn't have it and we couldn't seem to find it in print anywhere. Finally, my aunt managed to get it by, she got in touch with the Timaya Trust and then they went to great lengths and got us a copy. So it was a, it was a complex process in that sense. Yes, getting hold of the archival images was also a huge part of the process. And, you know, I remember months and months of just chasing down images, promising leads. We loved a photograph. We chased it down. We couldn't find who owned it, who had taken it. We went down to trying to find descendants because many of them were shot by American soldiers. You know, we looked up sort of... Uh, you know, references to who had died, whether we could track down their families. And a lot of it was, you know, definitely ended up in dead ends. But we were fortunate to have got guidance from a couple of photographer friends. Errol, Mike, if you've signed on, thank you. Your help was fantastic. And we then got permissions from the Pepperdine Collection, the Peabody Collection, the Peabody Library from Harvard, NARA, the Imperial War Museum, the UN Library. And you know, working with archival materials was a very exciting process because it's not really, you know, working with dead history. And there's a quote by Sue Breckel, from the, who's the archival director at the University of Brighton. And she says, archives are traces to which we respond. They're a reflection of ourselves. And our response to them says more about us than the archive itself. And we certainly felt that when we were working with these archives, because we were looking through time and through other eyes, but to shared histories. We also, I have to say, created fresh imagery. And uh, again, with the you know, help of Inco Center. And I have to say, I personally enjoyed the process of photographing and filming this richly layered process that included, and you know, scouting for chicken farms. We went out looking for chicken farms then finding the right kinds of chickens because some chickens could not have existed at that time. I mean, it was really funny and interesting. And, and there was also had, the chickens that would not act like chickens, which was yes, another. We had yeah. chickens who refused to perform. It was really quite funny. And then there were yeah. the chickens who, who began to die on us because it was too hot. So this was a cause of great alarm. Then we had to chase away cows, you know, I was sort of fussing over the look of a barbed wire saying, does that look antique enough and put some cobwebs on it? So, you know, uh, we, would, we wanted this fresh imagery to really merge in a, in a nice way with the archival images that we had. Yeah, I mean, the entire thing... <laughs> never a dull moment, for sure. Uh, the entire thing's taking time, I think. I, I mean, 
but the amount of time that we've been able to spend with the research and then with the process of putting the actual you know exhibition together um with the material that's also what's allowed us to make you know the connections and the juxtapositions that we have i i also should say i think the project has been quite revelatory with reference to our own practices. I have a background in documentary film studies, but I am primarily a playwright and a researcher. And, and when I came back after my master's, I was very much interested in um, sort of, you know, um, family histories and things like that. So when my aunt invited me onto the project, what we began with was really the material. And the idea was that I would bring in, you know, theatrical games, perhaps to activate some of that material. We'd talk about it and, um, you know, I, I think I did make her do a couple of theater exercises that hopefully she doesn't hate me for. Um, but, you know, in that way, and, and then, but when we actually approached the material, I found that, you know, my identity as an artist had to expand to really deal with it fully. And similarly, you know, my, my aunt, she writes, um, but when the project began, she was primarily known as a visual artist. And so she had to really engage in all kinds of interesting theatrics and, and writing processes. Um, the, the subject matter itself has demanded, you know, has demanded this from us. And it's meant that we've been able to collaborate in a really true sense. Yeah, I know collaboration is a very sort of hip word, but, you know, in this project, we really did because we were always looking at it through a double lens. Um, sort of emotionally for Nainthara, the grandfather she had never met. And for me, the father that I knew well, but who had died when I was relatively young. And I never knew him. As, I mean, I knew him as a general, but I never knew him as a soldier. And as the project moved along, as Nainthara said, um, the fact that it expanded our practices, you know, beautifully kind of melded it together so that in terms of ownership, everything really feels jointly done and collaborated on. So for example, these are a set of uh, hand-drawn maps that I did of the vanishing Palikarne. But it actually came from a suggestion from Nainthara saying, why don't we take the satellite imagery back into something hand-drawn? And at the same time, you know, Nainthara wrote something about Mr. H's sweetheart. And that came because I found this set of images in an archival library, which I said were well, fabulous. We've got to use this woman somehow. So, you know, um, there was a certain toing and froing, and I think we both learned a lot, you know, in terms of if there are any artists and writers out there, you know, it's, it's nice when you collaborate because you kind of allow your own practice to grow and expand a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely true. I mean, there's been a lot that we've gotten from the project, I think. Um, I, I, for me personally, and this is because, I, to some extent at least, my, my history of, of being able to do research, um, I, the most engaging aspect and the most rewarding has been the way in which it's opened up history to us. You know, we didn't set out to create any kind of archive, you know, even a fictional archive, but the word archive has come to be associated with the project and when, when sort of describing the kind of work we're doing. And it's really interesting to me because in a sense, um, you know, an archive is supposed to be a place where knowledge and artifacts are collected and organized, um, you know, officially. It's officially collected, officially organized. And when you go to it, it gives us an official history. But, you know, theorists like, you know, whether it's Foucault or Derrida or White, they've all shown us that, you know, archives do generally have their own organizing principles. And those principles are determined by lines of power. So that's what decides, you know, um, what we count as history, how we understand that history, how we come to know it. This is not to say that all archives are pointless, but it's just to point out that, you know, um, you know, archivization itself, it produces as much as it records an event. And our project is not an archive, but it plays with that idea. You know, how images and objects and facts are collected and organized, it's pivotal to our work. The, the reusing of photography, of historical events, and creating the semi-fictional history is also acknowledging how limited our understanding of the past is and how open that understanding should be and is to change itself. Yeah, I mean, archives and histories were two things that we constantly thought about when we were creating this. And we did use the histories of my father's time in Korea and other histories around the time, but we used it because we felt that the things that they were saying about war and immigration and ecology and the environment are all relevant to us still today. And so I just want to finish with a small story that kind of happened literally days ago. 
I had sent out to everybody I know an invitation to come to this talk in person or to join it on Zoom. And you know, this involves a very sprawling family tree of mine. And immediately there were two responses. One was from a cousin who said, did I know that his father had covered the Korean War as a journalist? And here was a salient fact. No, he didn't have any of his papers. My heart went sort of sank. I thought, oh, here was another source. But his father was supposed to have traveled on a Jeep with a certain Colonel Uninair, and he didn't. He went to Japan instead. Now, Colonel Uninair was somebody we had found in our researches as probably the first casualty, and some say the only casualty. He was a, a photographer who was covering a war journalist who was covering the war. And, you know, his Jeep had stumbled across a landmine and exploded, and sadly, he died. He is buried in Korea. And when his young wife, you know, passed away years and years and years later, she wanted her ashes to be taken to Korea interred there. So it was a very sort of tragic but beautiful story. So here was a kind of direct reference to someone who just by chance was not on the beach of the late Colonel Unimayer. And then another cousin reached out and said, had I heard about a colonel who had died tragically because a landmine had exploded because her cousin had been married to the late Colonel Unimayer. And I thought, you know, this is what history is, not something that's sort of dead and buried. And I got the sense that our story, our story of the Indians in Korea is, is a story that exists in a web of other stories. And I hope that that's what Chicken Run will do to reach out to you and draw you into this web and allow you to explore your own histories along with the histories and stories that we present to you. Thank you for being a wonderful audience, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Parvati. And um, thank you so much. I think one of the sort of the things that I've seen through in the process since we started dialoguing is the fact that uh, you guys are so thorough at the editing and sort of, you know, feedbacks. And um, since we decided that it's going to be a hybrid, uh, you've really rethought the structure of your project, what chicken run, how the chicken run would sort of engage with an audience, which just, you know, seated on their computers and are engaging with your project. Because initially what was proposed was also sort of a very immersive, uh, you know, multimedia installation, which include perform included performances like walkthroughs. And uh, that was really something that was a learning experience for me to sort of see how, you know, artistically both Nayantra and you were able to sort of reposition some of the core questions to sort of address an online audience. Um, one of the things that um, I think most of the questions I shared with you, we sort of, I'm going to go off script and sort of ask you another question about what was the kind of balancing act you had to do between looking at an archive and representing fact that, you know, what exactly happened in the image and uh, the kind of fictional narrative that you were developing? What were the gives? Um, did you ever feel that sometimes the, you know, the story that the photos had to say was actually more important and how, did you incorporate it within your sort of fictional narrative in any way? So I'll answer that a bit and then you can take over Nainthara. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, we'd always hoped that limit of change would be uh, a physical process where we would take a few people through an art and storytelling process, but you know, given COVID that didn't happen. But yes, I mean, we were always, uh, we always had, as you know, Bhuma said, you know, find that balancing line. And, you know, truthfully, Bhuma, can I say that your prompts through this process were really, really helpful. Bhuma was, you know, very collaborative with us in helping us develop this. And I, you know, both Nainthara and I really appreciated those curatorial prompts. So I think the one thing that we were clear about was that we would not change history. You know, we, we would, uh, there were gaps. I mean, there are sort of lacunas in history, which we can fill, but we would not actively rewrite it in any way, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Nantara? Yeah, I mean, and, and to sort of address sort of, you know, um, the other part of the question, which is what happens to the, you know, to the story that the photograph is actually telling. Uh, I mean, and I think that's kind of where we decided that the narrative could never be fixed. 
um, the, the narrative could only suggest a possibility to what that photograph is showing you and never actually tells you that that's definitely what it is. Because what we were really hoping and what we're hoping will happen is that when people sort of go through the website, that they will also um, go off and look at our little, you know, um, image index, which tells you, you know, where the actual photographs are from, who they were taken by, what archives they belong to. Um, and in that sense, also sort of gather the, the larger history around it. But that was that was kind of the way that we walked that tightrope of not, you know, also just using the photos for our for our purposes and for our needs. So, yeah. yeah, and I just sort of also wanted to add that, you know, this is really a, a long, it's an, you know, the Korean War is called the Forgotten War. And this episode of India going there is an almost forgotten part of Indian history and Korean history, and yet it's really important. And there was a quote that I wanted to share with you, which was uh, the contribution of the CFI that President Eisenhower in a letter to the Indian Prime Minister Pandit Nehru in February 19, 1954 said that no military unit in recent years has undertaken a more delicate and demanding peacetime mission than that faced by the Indian forces in Korea. So I would just sort of leave you with that thought as well. I think um, I'd like to open the floor to uh, you know questions. If anybody you'd like to address, either Nantra or Parvati. Okay, can you have a light so that see? Yeah. Uh, anybody joining us online, please put your questions in the the Q and A box, and we'll we'll have it read out here. Thank you. Ashrafi Bhagat, yeah. Uh, it's not a question, but I just want to compliment you, congratulate you. And as usual, you've done tremendous work along with Nayantara, right? Yeah. And uh, I found it very captivating, uh, very insightful in the way you have used your the archival material and uh, you know juxtaposed uh, fiction with reality and uh, how well you have woven together that that for a moment i thought uh, am i seeing the reality or am i seeing the fiction you know it was uh, it was so good it was so well uh, you know knitted together and uh, i think that was the best part of it uh, i mean i've seen videos but this is something where you have uh, engaged with the archival material and articulated it in uh, such an expressive manner that at certain points, you know, it also aroused emotions in me, looking at it as to, you know, what uh, Mr. P or Mr. H or, or, you know, whoever you have assigned these uh, characters and identity. Uh, actually came very much alive in my mind. So, you know, I never, I never felt that this is something which you have dug up from somewhere. I thought it was a living reality that was going on. So wonderfully done, so absorbing it was. And for me, it was uh, such a tremendous experience. And of course, uh, knowing you, Parvati, there is always an intellectual angle which makes it so different. And you're so articulate that your words actually mesmerize. So thank you for this experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashrafi. Uh, thank you so much. I think um, I may share if, if that's okay that she was my teacher in college and continues to inspire. And we do need you know, those, those supports and those forms of inspiration. So really, Ashrafi, it goes both ways. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Is there a question? I think we have a few questions from our online audience, if we can take them. Yep, there's um, someone called Reke Naya whose hand is up here. 
We're just going to uh, call upon the person who's, who's raised their hand on the Zoom call. Could I request you to put your camera and on and come and ask the question yourself? Well, oh, thank you. In fact, uh, uh, I was quite uh, new to the whole uh, session itself. Uh, quite impressive. Uh, learned a lot. Wanted to thank uh, both and both the artists for the brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. This one. Wanted to just thank Ashrafi as she's leaving. Thank you very much for the, the that wonderful supportive comments that you gave us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure working with Parvati and Nayantara. As you rightly say, Bhuma, they are extremely thorough. And I think they, uh, they bring to it so much of intellectual rigor that is required for a project of this sort not to distort history, but to reimagine, to revisit, and to understand something which, if we don't bring to the fore, is going to be lost forever, so for generations to come as well. And I just want to say that this, as Parvati mentioned, is a slice of a larger project, which we hope in 2022 or 23, pandemic notwithstanding, that we would be able to present right here in Chennai and maybe elsewhere. Uh, there's still a Korean leg and a visit there due because there's a lot of information there and I think a lot of people whom the team might want to interview and you know collect material from. Um, I think there are bits and pieces here as well, Parvati, what you ended up with, with the story that your cousins brought to the fore. Um, there is somebody here who's part of that family, and I will definitely link you up so you can take that away and do, do stuff. But I also wanted to say how well this project sits with the current edition of CPB, and thanks to Buma and Suchi Varun for giving us this opportunity, because I think the whole idea of maps and mapping and plotting and looking at spaces and coalescing time, etc., is all really very important. And the, the, the very important word of disquiet. And I think disquiet is what it's been all the way through. I know from a biographical personal angle for Parvati and Nayantara having revisiting something that's so close to them and then going back in history and stitching it together in a neutral sort of way that takes tremendous courage, I think. And I think it needs to, you need to have that, that control not to get hagiographic about it, not to get overly on the personal side, but to look at it from all angles. So I think the disquiet is also for the viewer. And again, Ashrafi mentioned getting emotional. We were, there were several moments there where you looked at it and said, gosh, you know, this is something that I can relate to. Here's somebody from my past who's there, who's figured there, you know. So there are various bits in terms, and I think disquiet in the nicest sort of way, if that's, that's the phrase to use, um, which allows for reflection and which allows for interrogation and which allows for setting off various other thought processes, I think. Because that's the only way history stays alive. If it's going to be relegated to a book on a shelf, and something you don't relate to at all, it's as good as dead. So thank you both of you for persevering on this and to everybody who's uh, online as well as everyone here. And I hope as the exhibition unfolds, there's more to come. So this is, this is the teaser of more to come. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nantara, would you like to sort of do a vote of thanks to everybody? <laughs> Yeah, just yes, sure. Um, I mean, no, just thank you everyone for turning up um, and thank you to the CPB team for putting this together, getting me online, making it possible to address all of you from my large screen. Um, and just, I mean, we've, we've, we've been able to touch so many lives with this project before it even went on, the people that we've talked to for research, people who've given us, you know, wonderful insights. Um, we've worked with, you know, um, with archivists, um, you know, 
who are in different countries. We work with video editors here, uh, with the team at Inco Center, and we owe all of these people such such a huge thanks for um, helping us put this project together. And also to um, of course, to Hyun Suk, I hope I don't know if he's here and watching, but he um, was a big part of our new photography, the, the new photographs that are part of the exhibition as well. And without him, it wouldn't have been possible. So big thanks to him as well. And uh, and to our families who have listened to us talk about this for a couple of for a long time now <laughs> um, and who've been very supportive and contributed so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for being such a wonderful live audience as well. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Bhuma. Thank you, CPP. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this evening. Uh, we look forward to the project's sort of next iteration beyond CPP. So uh, I think at least in Chennai, we'd love to have an exhibition happening in 2022, like you said. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And have a lo lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.